Welcome. If you found your way here, you finally made it to the sunny side. It's the sunny side with Al, the only A Sun basketball podcast there is, um, with the only man who probably watches enough A Sun basketball to make this possible. I don't have Pops with me today, man. I couldn't get Pops to get his stuff together, man. He's uh, he's a busy man, so he he was trying to get his stats and trying to get his previews and everything together, but he's not here in time. So I said, Pops, man, John Rothstein said it was 123, 123 days away to the start of college basketball season. So I said, man, I just have to get this out of me. I've been looking at lineups. I've been looking at people getting out on the recruiting trail, conference schedules, man, and I'm just too pumped. Uh, so hopefully there's other people out there looking for some kind of A-Sun content. Uh, and here we go, man. This is, welcome to the sunny side, and you found it. This is the place where we're going to try to get into uh, every game throughout the season. We're going to do team previews every week as we lead up to the season. We're going to do some preseason rankings, uh, just kind of predictions all the way throughout and just, you know, try to give you as much info as we know. Uh, just like on a, at any ASUN school, it's going to be hard to get all the inside info unless your boots on the ground in that city. Uh, so we appreciate anybody reaching out with any kind of inside info that we might need for uh, during the season or even this, these preseason rankings be much appreciated. Uh, with all that, with that being said, man, we're going to try to be consistent and come out every week, uh, publish as much as we can. We're going to be in tank tops and Hawaiian shirts the whole time because this is the Atlantic sun and this is because it's the sunny side, right? We're going to have a little fun. So let's get into it. This is the first team ranking starting with the worst. Wow, I hate to say the worst. The team with the worst record in the league last year, and that's the North Alabama basketball team. Okay. Um, worst record for sure. Lost a lot of close games. Okay. They're nine and 21. Finished last, only two wins in the A Sun, one against Kennesaw State, one against EKU. Had a couple games there, could have flip flopped, wouldn't have really mattered in terms of place very much for them. Uh, entering Pujols fourth year, um, had a good couple years before last year. Last year was a pretty down year. Uh, but this year, it looks like they're getting pieces in to start to put the puzzle together again. The one thing I will before I get into the team preview too much, man, the hashtag stalking ambush is by far the best hashtag uh, a son has to offer, I believe. May, they, they might not have the best social media team, but by far, that's the best hashtag, stalk and ambush, because it's going to lead into some possibilities with some lineup changes they have, I think. Uh, so I don't know if there's some talks going on behind the scenes between Pujol and the social media team, but stalk and ambush, man, I, I think is going to play into some, uh, some cool lineups this year that they could possibly have. So the first thing I want to do, uh, just to get everybody familiar with the team, if, if you're not, if you're, say, if you're a Liberty fan, just looking for some information on some opponents, uh, the first thing you're going to, with the transfer market the way it is now, you're going to look at departures, right? Uh, what did they lose? Uh, from a 9-21 and 21 team, you would hope you didn't lose a lot. You would hope it was just a, a young team trying to improve. But really, um, outside looking in, you lose two pretty big pieces in C.J. Brim and Jamari Blackman. Um, We'll start with C.J. Brim first, right? Uh, just from watching, you would say floor general, kind of leader of the team, uh, initiate some offense. But really, uh, overall, C.J. kind of struggled, man, with with assists and turnovers. With, with with being a primary ball handler, you would hope for a little bit of uh, a better turn, turnover, assist turnover ratio. Uh, didn't shoot it well from three either. Uh, so really being able to space the floor as well it was just kind of an issue. So um, at the end of the day, on the offensive end, you know, in my opinion, and I hate to say this as he's leaving, but I don't think you're losing much in C.J. Brim. Uh, smaller guy, great his shot his own shot a little bit and get to the rim, uh, but obviously not much of a creator for the rest of the team and really not, not a great shooter. Um, now, he did. He was top 20 in assists uh, two years he was there. Um, really, but the where you're going to miss him the most is in his defense, okay? He can get after it. That's 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 no there, – there's no denying that. He's 16th in the A-Sun in defensive win shares. That means something, uh, especially uh, I would consider them to probably amp up the tempo a little bit more, especially going back to that hashtag, stalk and ambush. So, really, with losing him, you lose a little bit of defensive piece on the guard end, but he, he, he is smaller. So 
and I think through some additions you're going to hear about here, I think we're going to be able to replace him pretty good. Okay, so you lose C.J. Bram. And then really the, the biggest loss and the one that's going to be most hard to replace is Jamari Blackman. Um, Jamari played four years, right? But uh, and it was really great. I mean, Jamari pretty much started every game he ever played at North Alabama. Uh, averaged around two assists, uh, shot at his three points at 32% uh, through his career, right about 40% clip from the two. Um, he shot it a lot, right? That shot it a lot, just like uh, the man Daniel Ortiz does as well. But, you know, he had a couple seasons of top 20 in steals. Um, 1920, he was top 10 in win shares. Uh, 1920, he was top 10 in offensive win shares. Um, He's been in top 20 in field goal attempts across the board each time. Uh, top 20 in defensive win shares two years ago. Uh, but if you as you start to kind of peel apart Jamari's background and his time at UNA, and once again, I don't mean to say, hey, shut the door as you leave, but really 1820 and 1920 were Jamari's best seasons. Um the last the last year, especially, and I don't know if that kind of runs into some new guys they had or just kind of switching over to a newer scheme. But I don't feel like Jamari kind of lost his footing and, and kind of had better defensive numbers later in his career, 21-22, better defensive numbers, like defensive rating is 99. So that's top 20 in the sun. It's pretty good. Uh, so you're looking at a creator you're going to lose. You're looking at a shot maker you're going to lose to go along with Ortiz and a good defensive guy, right? But the thing is, both of those guys are small guards. Both of those guys are small guards um, to pair along really with um, the top guy in usage and Daniel Ortiz. Keeping that those three together, I don't think it's going to get you anywhere. So uh, you definitely hate to see Jamari go. But at this point, at the turn they're trying to make probably in northern Alabama next year, I would say this is almost a good thing. Um, outside looking in, this team will have – more athleticism, more height, and more length because these guys are gone and the additions that they added. So that that's that's an interesting piece. Now, where are Jamari's shots going to go? Um, where are Jamari's and CJ's assist and kind of creation abilities go? Who who takes the main guard slot on the defensive end each time, right? Because uh, if you look at some of um, your other guards on the team, not as good at defensive numbers, right? Maybe maybe we're leaning on Blackman and C.J. Brim a little bit. So it'll be interesting to see what they do with that. Okay, so got our departures there. You know, it's going to happen. You're you're going to see this in, in a lot of different teams through the A-Sun. Uh, we're going to talk about departures first, and then we're going to go on to who have we added in, um, not only freshman-wise, but transfer, JUCO, other D1 school, it doesn't matter. I mean, really, in the A-Sun, they've came, they've came from everywhere this year. So this is actually going to be really, really fun. Uh, UNA is one of the biggest classes in A-Sun coming in, uh, which is cool. It gives us more, more to talk about, man, more to speculate on, right? When you get these guys in and you start putting these theoretical lineups together against Ortiz, you can start to say, hey, well, maybe we have some options here. Okay, so for those of you who aren't, the devout North Alabama fans, I'm going to go through the additions to the roster now. Okay. So probably my favorite um, addition and well, I wouldn't say my favorite, probably X factor addition of the whole class uh, would be Bryson Dawkins. Team big guard, six, three lengthy dude, average three steals a game, average 22 a game, average eight rebounds a game, and will absolutely put one on your head, right? North Alabama does not have that. They did not have that last year. This is a piece I think is going to make a big difference in the lives of Daniel Ortiz and another name I'll mention here after him and Jakari Lane. When you have a guy like that, a 6'3", who, and you're that lengthy and you're that athletically gifted and really if you just watch some highlights you know his physicality is crazy too right so you put him there not only to stalk and ambush but a guy at six three with that might be able to guard some four right might be able to switch one through five occasionally depending on the lineups 
it's hard not to love what this adds in terms of versatility to what they do because CJ Brim and Blackman were, were small and very much who they were on offense. This kind of gives you potential on the offensive end to become an even greater out on the break finisher, somebody who can actually create as well. And then on the defensive side, you're talking about it could be an absolute stopper and will be um, you I'm calling it now. We'll be on Sports Center top ten at least once. Um, please, man, everybody else, watch your head in the sun. <laughs> if this guy's coming down the court at any time and cocks that left hand back, I promise you, if I'm in the gym, I'm turning around and covering my eyes because it's about to be bad. All right, that's a player to watch, man. I'm excited about him. And really, the the second person I'm most excited about uh, is Jakari Lane, and that's just another another guard they brought they brought they brought in um, Huntsville, Alabama two-time state champ. Um, he's a smaller guy, but average 21 a game and will get after it defense, defensively, man. Um, if you watch some of his tape and the way he navigates through ball screens and the way he comes and creates off those ball screens and gets it to people in the right position, it's big time, right? You can see that working next to a guy like Ortiz or even working like a guy next to Dawkins, right? somebody who doesn't have to have they have their ball in their hands right we're going to get a good shot every time down the court and I think when Jakar you have that somebody who's you know six foot six two get after it stalk and ambush as well right like he he's going to get steals he played in the up-tempo offense in high school you add those two guys in to kind of fill those defensive spots for North Alabama that Brim and Blackman both left not saying they can come in day one and do this but I think day one, you will have people who are just as comparable on defense and have a huge offensive upside for Lane especially and really Dawkins too, right? Uh, Lane is going to be able to come in day one and run an offense. I'm going to make a statement here, and and really and people outside North Alabama are probably going to be like, oh, what? He's going to be an all-A-Sun freshman team. He's just going to. Uh, if this If this season goes well for them, I believe it's because he probably made a big jump or he's done more than what people thought he was going to do, right? No matter what state you're in, if you're a two-time state champion and you're the guy with the ball on the string every time down the floor, you're a winner, okay? Simple as that, you're a winner. Those two guys, for me, my man Tony Pujol, I, I, those are – home runs for me it doesn't matter what the ratings look like I think if you go watch those guys play in the gym you say okay yeah those guys are going to stalk an ambush we can put them besides we're teasing we're going to play uh the third guy which another guard uh three guard heavy uh Aiden Cool out of Colorado now you're going to see Aiden Cool you're going to see Buttry from East EKU you're going to see um Potter Porter from Liberty right all same build. I'm not going to say they're all the same game because they're all going to get probably sensitive about it. I, would, I know I would. Um, same type of game, right? If you lined them all three up at uh, you're going to pick teams, didn't watch any of these, any of these guys' plays. They're, they're all pretty similar, right? They're going to pull from anywhere, okay? They're those guys that those AAU highlight films are pulling from two steps beyond half court, and, you know, doing the Steph Curry and walking around. And they can hit it, man. This guy will hit it from – anywhere uh, two people on him i uh, love the left-handed stroke and really the best thing about him i think is because his looks so pure i think he shot a lot off the dribble and just the film that i saw but really if you can imagine him kind of playing like an off guard to a, a jacari lane or e even to a bryson dawkins right so if you get bryson dawkins to start doing a little playmaking have him as somebody who just can is literally knocked down from anywhere uh, it'll be interesting to see what he does on the defensive side, just like the other two guys I mentioned from EKU and Liberty. I think their offensive game will come in and translate, maybe not right away, right? Maybe early on in the A-Sun or later on in the A-Sun, you know, they start picking it up. I, I feel like those guys are more projects, right? We're going to see these guys around here for two or three years um, and hopefully get better, hopefully grow in size. Now, what's probably going to hold him back the most, and I'm just making an assumption because I didn't see any anything on his defense, anything on defensive highlights. The biggest thing is going to hold him back is on the defensive end, right? You, you're, um, you're a six-foot small guard. Um, 
you, you're on a switch in the A-Sun, right, against those against the teams who are going to make you pay, right, for a bad switch. Don't know if he finds the floor very much in the A-Sun coming down, but it'll be super interesting to see what Pujol does with him and really just to see how those three guys all, like, who of those three will actually stand out early and who of those three will be the best product at the end will be the most will be the most intriguing thing. Um, so keep going here, yeah, because UNA's got a huge class, right? Uh, <laughs> the finish, Nicholas Gustafson. Now, if I said that wrong, my man Nick, call me out on it. You, you've already interacted a little bit on Twitter. Call me out on it. Um, talk about pull from everywhere. Now, I said Aiden Cool will pull from anywhere, right? I feel like we throw that around a lot. Um, this man, Nicholas Gustafson, took some shots, even in his highlights, coming off screens, probably with three hands in his face. I'm not even sure dude saw the rim and it didn't hit anything, right? Went straight in. Um, <laughs> those kind of shots are going to make somebody like me, who I, I, I never, even when I played ball, I never liked that. It wasn't, didn't shoot it very much. Somebody like me, it's going to make them blush, right? At Pops, I will let Pops watch his highlight tape one time, and Pops was like, oh, my goodness, who's his coach, right? But you shoot like that, right, especially at a community college that he was at. So they pull it up here. So you go to eastern Wyoming, and you average 12 points a game, and you shoot it from 40, 41% behind the arc, right? That's hitting four threes a game. And, you know, flip a coin, man, if it's going to go in, that's – you got to love that, right, as an instant floor spacer. And he's big. Like, he's six five, and actually it has a little muscle on him. Um, not saying that's – I'm not saying it's going to help him a ton on defense, but really six five, that's that's a pretty big body. It's a pretty big forward. Uh, somebody just to at least stretch the floor on the offensive end. Uh, if you can keep that above a 35% clip, right, that's a good shooter. Put him in the corner. Let Lane, let uh, Dawkins, let uh, Ortiz create around him. Let him get some shots open. Uh, do I think he has creation ability? Not sure. Didn't look like he did much of it. Uh, it'd be interesting to see because uh, he's still got some some years left. So it'll be interesting to see if he adds anything to his game other than just kind of being able to be that guy who's a floor spacer who can just pull anytime he has the ball. So uh, shout out to the finish, man. This could be a, a 6'5", Lori Markinen. Uh, but hopefully, you know, we'll see. Uh, and really, the, the next guy, it's another, I mean, if that's something, it's something really I should have pointed out before. OK, let's let's stop real quick. I want to point something out before, because I, I just want to tell you how good of a recruiting class I think this is. And not just in terms of talent wise, but in terms of what they needed as a team. This is exactly what they needed as a team. Give me a second here. OK, so. Your offensive efficiency rating as a team is 351 in the league, in the, in, in the nation, right? 355 in effective field goal percentage, 347 in three-point percentage, and 351 in two-point percentage. And that's all on the offensive end, okay? So there's a reason why you add guys like Gustafson. You add guys like Aiden Cool and Jakari Lane. And this next guy is another one, then Daniel Braster, okay? Daniel Braster might be the thing that makes this team go. Just like, I mean, I think it's right there with Dawkins in terms of X factor on how good this team can be. Braster for me, six seven, little bit slight of a frame, uh, you know, 195, 200. But if you look at his points, for, you know, he's 14, 15 points per game, shoots it around 33% from deep and average almost 10 rebounds. Six eight's not small. He's slim, but can still shoot it multiple times. I know this is all highlights, man. I, I know that we're seeing the best of these kids when you look on YouTube. But really, you watch Braster sometimes. He'll get it off the board and just push, right? Push, go off a screen, and transition and make a play. If you add that, right? Add that to your team already of the guys you have coming in, but you add in a guy that can not only be a secondary playmaker with an Ortiz or with a lane, okay, you put them on the same lineup. He can not only be a secondary playmaker, but he can also space the, space the floor at the same time. So if, if the ball doesn't get to him, it doesn't get to him, right? 
but he can do a little bit in and out both um, block some shots as well. So I think him improving as a defensive player will happen there. I think he's going to get a lot of back end blocks. What I mean by that, you know, when you stalk and ambush and you have guys like freaking Dawkins and Lane sprinting at you at all times, guys like Brasser on the back end can you pin some shots up against the backboard pretty easy, right? Um, you have multiple people who did that last year already for North Alabama. I think he comes in instantly provides playmaking. Okay. If he gets better and better and better, this is another call I'm going to make, right? You're probably going to hear me make thousands of these. This is a, an uh, ace on newcomer at the end of the year award. Like not, maybe not the number one, but he's going to be on the all newcomer team. Uh, definitely. If you're just counting Juco guys, this is one of my top Juco guys coming into the league. Just because, man, having that kind of six eight frame would be able to do those things and have those skills, I, I would love to see what he does in this offense and what he does in this system. It's big on Daniel Braster. Uh, and really, the two last guys both transfers in from other D1 programs, and I'll talk about one of them short here, and the other one I actually want to go in depth a little bit more. Uh, but the number – oh, let me go back to another another reason why that Daniel Braster went down to Lamar and Port Arthur, UGK, best rep group of all – duo of all time. You come straight from Port Arthur. You go straight into North Alabama, okay? You get you a little UGK duo going between Ortiz and Braster both. Like, I just love the, the storyline of the guy coming in here, being able to be a, a forward. I think it's cool. But um, – and I'm going to butcher this man's name. Uh, but Ewan Nelson. Okay, Irish man, Irish big fella. Okay, uh, and you can pull up his stats. You can pull up where he played. Just there's not going to be a lot. Didn't really get in much. I uh, believe he's hurt a little bit of the time. But he is a big body. Okay, very big body. Okay, 6'10", 6'11", um, up in the twos. He's going to push weight around. I mean, he is going to be a screener of all screeners. Okay, and really that's what I – to start off, that's what I would probably have him do. Hey, man, you come up here, and if that's how we're going to start it, right, with Lane, Braster, um, Ortiz, uh, Dawkins with the ball, come set a screen, you're going to get leveled, okay? You're just going to get leveled. I, I don't know if he's – I wonder how his conditioning is in terms of rim run. Um, if he's one of those guys who can sprint back and forth, that's going to be huge. I think you have some other bigs in the league. Uh, especially at some of the bigger programs that may, might not be able to run the floor as well. So if he can actually run the floor as well and then put some weight on people, um, he adds an interesting piece alongside Damian Forrest. I think if you put him, mix those two guys together and kind of make up, a, we'll say, 30 minutes a game, that's a solid, solid big man, the A-son. I, to get that out of him, uh, to get like a 6-6 six and six or a 7-5, and five, consistent out of him would be absolutely huge. Don't know if that's going to happen. Uh, defensive end, I'm, I'm not really sure what he provides in terms of block presence. I'm sure he's going to be a great re rebounder. Sure, sure he's going to be a great screener. And, and once again, hey, if, if I butchered your name, holler at me, man. I'm, I'm trying to work on it, okay? Uh, and really the last one in terms of adding people is K.J. Johnson. Comes straight from Lipscomb, right? Um, this – that one is the most intriguing, right? Because, and, and really, K.J. Johnson might be one of the most intriguing people in the A-Sun in general. Um, he was on the all-freshman team in 1920, um, top 20 in points in 1920, uh, top 20 in points in 1920 and 2021, um, top, in, top 20 in assists in all three of his years, right? So you just see this, you see this grow in here, okay? I mean, he, he can play your efficiency rating, 13th in 1920, eighth last year. Uh, 2021, he was 14th in win shares. You're getting a ready-to-go D1 basketball player who on the offensive side is ready to roll, right? He can be fit in in your starting lineup day one. And really, and I'm going to go ahead and shout him out, the offensive win shares too, 1920 and 2021, that's top 10 in both. That's no joke, man. But now you start to realize, or you start to wonder more than anything, is what was the difference in 1920 and 2021 to what happened last year? Okay. A lot of those things went down. Turnover, turnover percentage went up. Usage percentage 
has ticked down every year. Offensive win share percentage, offensive win shares in general, down every year. Defensive win shares, down every year. Um, not sure if he was hurt a lot or not, um, or if he was just dealing with coaching. Maybe the, the rotation wasn't really going his way. Uh, maybe he already knew he wanted to come back here, man. I, I'm not really sure. Um, but if K.J. Johnson can somehow – turn the clock back to that 1920 to that 2021. Okay. I mean, he shot it at 39% from behind the line in 2021, 2020 and 2021, 35%, 19 and 20. He can shoot, he can play make. Okay. That's another piece that might actually be able to slide in early so that you could give guys like Dawkins and Lane time to come in and really develop. Okay. So maybe KJ, gets back to that, maybe he doesn't. Maybe he's a role player for this team, and that's fine, too, because he is a proven Atlantic Sun basketball player, made the all, the all-A Sun freshman team. Maybe a new home just makes him reinvigorated. Maybe he gets back to that that top 10 and win shares form. Let's hope, right? For Northern Alabama's sake, I think that's a huge get for them, uh, along with everybody else in the class. Um, those are all your additions to the team. That's that's a team in itself, right? Uh, there are a lot of question marks, I think, with a big class like this and really with so much weight being on these guys that are coming in, it's kind of hard to understand and predict how they're going to look going forward. Um, of course, you can, you can make up different how they're going to play, different lineups and things like that, um, but you just don't really know. So you go back to... And that man, I, I love, I'm, I'm a Ken Palm addict, uh, but Ken Palm does probably my favorite things, the most frequent lineups, right? So over the last five games, most frequent lineups, top two for North Alabama last year, Brim, Ortiz, Blackman, Suse, Howe. Brim, Ortiz, Blackman, Suse, Forrest. Brim, Ortiz, Brown, Suse, Forrest. Okay, so... Ortiz is in every one of these lineups. Brim was in every one of these lineups. Uh, Blackman was in half of these lineups. What makes those lineups interesting, and really um, I kind of want to go to some people who are returning as well. What makes those lineups interesting is you're losing, and Brim was so consistent in those lineups, good, bad, or indifferent. That's gone. Okay. And then you take guys who are returning in terms of Suse and Howe, um, and Detalian Brown, okay, those three right there are all returning guys, all had minutes, all put in great time for this. But with these new guys coming in, what does their role look like? Okay, do they all – do they take jumps? I, I think there's a big space there for Detalian Brown. Uh, there was last year even, okay. I mean, average 22 minutes a game last year. You know, Blackman's in front of you. He's gone now, okay. Didn't shoot it great but he can shoot it great, okay? There's 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 clips over his time, his first year at the A-Sun that he actually did shoot it really good. So the big spot for him, potentially a lot of minutes up to, up for grabs there. But and then really when you go to Hal and Forrest, I keep looking at it, man. And somebody tell me if I'm wrong. I, I just – I keep looking at Hal and Forrest. I'm like, why is – now, no offense, but why is Dallas Hal playing that much more over Damian Forrest? Damian Forrest, ladies and gentlemen, okay, for those people who uh, may not be paying attention. Let me pull this back up here. Damian Forrest, defensive rebounding percentage, top 10 in the league. Block percentage, top 10 in the league. Okay. This guy, okay, here we end this some more here. Offensive rebounds, top 12 in the league. He had 22 blocks just in the A Sun, top 10 in blocks per game, top 15 in rebounds per game. 16 kids, super long, finisher, rim runner. I want to see this is the person I'm calling out of those three names Brown, Suse, and Forrest. I think Damian Forrest makes a jump. I think Damian Forrest has to make a jump for them to be better on the defensive side, right? If you're going to truthfully, and, and once again, I'm going to come back to that stalk and ambush. When you come back to that stalk and ambush and you go Dawkins Lane, Ortiz, 
Brown, and they're getting up in people, right? You're going to get those back end blocks a lot. But Forrest was already there last year, already making plays last year, going five and five across 28 games. Would love to see that at 10 and seven, okay? Get a block or two a game. That would completely transform this team. I think you add him in on the backside, and if you make your other four guys on the floor versatile enough, or if they are versatile enough, I think that gives you a one through five potential full full switch, depending on guard wise who you have in there. But I do think that Forrest could defend those screens and switch about on anybody he's going to see on the floor. So I, I would really like to see how he goes. Now, same thing could be said. Same thing could be said for Suse, right? Like, I'm, and once again, I'm probably butchering that name, but six five guy listed as a guard but really didn't shoot it. Um, rebounds well, plays defense well, but not great. Okay, he's he's good, good role player. Not really sure what his role looks like with all this guy and these new guys coming in. Not sure what his role, look, not even sure what his jump would look like if he was to make a jump and where do his minutes come. Very interested to see that. Um, and same thing with Dallas Howe. I like Dallas Howe. I think 6'7" with the ability to kind of stretch it out. Uh, that's that's what he was there for, right? If, if you go, I'll go back and deep into their Kim Palm. When he's on the floor, um, you know, he uh, he takes the second most three-point attempts when he's on the floor. Um, and he's always that way. If you look down through these lineups, he's he dominant. Other than Ortiz um, and then sometimes Blackman. House always the guy who's going to take that three-point shot. When you add – Guys like Braster and Gustafson and KJ Johnson and Jakari Lane. Not sure if those three point shots are going to be there for him necessarily. Okay. So if you take that away from him and he doesn't really give you that um, on the offensive side anymore, and then you go to look at his defensive win shares and uh, defensive plus or minus, it's, it's okay. It's, it's good. Okay. Not great. Um, he's 13th in block total blocks. Um, but he, uh, did have some foul, foul issues. Um, but just not sure really where he fits, right? If he makes a jump, it would be to become an even better shooter and an even better backline defender. But once again, with Nelson coming in and Braster coming in and Forrest already there, what does his role look like? He's a starter a lot of times. Um, what does his role look like? I, I'm not really sure. So those are the guys. I kind of want the returning guys. So now you kind of get an idea of what the roster looks like. Um, everybody, if, if you are have watched A-Sun at all, I'm, I, I don't even want to go over Daniel Ortiz. I mean, um, we can uh, later on, but dude's a flat-out score. Um, his usage was top in the league, I believe, usage percentage. Um, Two-point attempts way up there, three-point attempts way up there. His percentages were down last year, okay? But for a guy who has to lead a team as a freshman and take those many, take as many shots as he did, um, to be able to go and be top 15 and complete box plus or minus, to be top 10 in offensive box plus or minus, um, to be top 10 in effective field goal percentage, that's saying something. That's a, a big-time basketball player. He potentially, if you add these guys in, you know, if you want to go best case scenario, the ball starts to get the roll in in your favor. If Ortiz, you know, maybe won't even average as many points per game as he did like did last year. You know, you're looking at you're looking at 22, uh, 20, yeah, 22 a game in conference. Even if that number decreases to around 18, he gets up to about five, six assists. I think this team's better because of it. Um, better because of it. And I think his game gets recognized more because of it. I think oftentimes um, you can see those big shot attempts. You can see a couple turnovers every once in a while. Like, hey, he has a lot to learn. But one, that man's a freshman um, on a, a struggling team, the A-Sun, and he, he did what he had to do. I think he is going to have a breakout year. I'm calling if they finish in the top half of the league, I think he gets first team, second team honors, has to, uh, if they finish, if they make that big of a turnaround, for sure. Uh, so now, man, this is my probably my favorite part. This is my guilty pleasure across all teams in the A-Sun. 
Um, I like to mess around with lineups. What would I do if I was a coach, right? What would I, what my lineup of death would be? What would be, give me my most uh, defensive versatility? What gives me my one through five switch? What gives me, hey, let's get up in them for this next stretch until this TV timeout for these next four minutes. Let's go as hard as we can. What gives, what lineup gives us that, right? So I played around a little bit and this is kind of what I came up. I think if you go, I think I can see Pujol going like Lane, Ortiz, KJ Johnson, um, then get Brasser or Hal to take one of those spots and then Forrest. I think that is probably your best just overall lineup. I think that may be the lineup he goes to down the stretch is that Lane, Ortiz, Johnson, Brasser, Forrest. Um, gives you floor spacing and Ortiz, Johnson, and Braster, depending on how Lane shoots it at the college level. Lane could shoot it well, All right? So that potentially gives you four decent shooters with a guy in force who's a real backline defender, two playmakers in – or potentially four playmakers, right? Because K.J. Johnson at one time was one of the best playmakers in the league. Braster has those playmaking abilities. Ortiz can make plays. Lane can play, make plays. So that gives you a ton of offensive versatility. Um, gives you that ability to stock and ambush as well with Ortiz and Lane. Um, that's the lineup I would come out with if I was Pujol. Now, um, if you want to go small, if you want to go that stock and ambush style, I think if you go Lane, Dawkins, Ortiz, Brown, and then on the back half, you kind of go Nelson Forrest, you know, Nelson to give you just like he's going to grab those other four guys. Hey, don't even worry about it. Nelson's just going to clean it up once that shot's missed. But you put Lane and Dawkins out there to f- just to start that initial pressure, start that initial um, stalk on the ball, right? That takes so much pressure off of Ortiz to have to guard those guys on that uh, on the defensive end all the time, those guys, guys on the defensive end. Okay, and then you put Brown there as well, potentially stretch the floor but has a potential to be a very a better defender this year. So you're looking at Dawkins, Brown, and then your backline guy, all switchable. Um, but really, the one thing I want to point out in this lineup is I think Dawkins is used very much this year in different spots. Uh, I think he'll get playing time, not sure how much, but you'll see him, I think, at all times guarding bigger guys You'll see him all times pressuring the ball because of his length and athleticism and his height. He is going to help people like Lane, Ortiz, and Brown immensely uh, just from his presence on the defensive end. Uh, Then finally, kind of my last uh, little play around here, uh, and this is if, you know, if you want to go big, and I I think you can, and I – it, it would be fun to see this lineup, especially if you wanted really uh, – if Dawkins' playmaking kind of came and you're like, hey, that's that's not bad. If Pujol really trusted him with the ball, you could go Dawkins, Ortiz, Johns, or Dawkins, Dawkins, Ortiz, Braster, Howe, and Forrest, right? Now, switchability-wise on the back end there, not sure if Braster could switch anybody or even switch all the way down. And same thing with Hal. He might get exposed on that th- guy if you end up guarding a three. But talk about being very big, okay, and Hal, Forrest, and Braster. Being able to shoot it in Ortiz, Braster, and Hal. Okay, so that, that spaces the floor as well. So that just gives you another look that you can mix in. And that's probably the biggest piece that this recruiting class adds is the versatility that that Pujol can have as he goes into the A-Sun season. And, and really, he'll figure that – he's going to figure that out. They're going to learn early early on in their just non-conference schedule who has it, who's going to be there for us, um, and, and what they can do. So, Mr. Pujol, hey, man, that's that's just my two cents on the lineups there. You do do what you think. Um, just a couple we, – we talked about some of these X factors a little bit. Uh, but just just some things to kind of leave you with. The, the K.J. Johnson bounce back here is going to be huge for this team. Um, the guard duo and Lane and Dawkins, how they come along will be huge in this team. My man, Daniel Braster from Port Arthur, the underground Kings, what he does and how he transfer, tra- goes into the A-Sun. And really, what does Daniel Ortiz now do when he 
is on the offensive end with the amount of shooters he has now and the amount of really the amount of I think he added more playmakers and, and that's not to, you know, say anything about Blackman and, um, or Brim. I think he's got more playmakers. He's got more athleticism now. So what does he look like? I know he's probably in the lab all summer, right? Those guys are going to make huge jumps. Those people who are good as freshmen and make that, put that time in that sophomore leap is, is just huge sometimes. So that could be huge. I think that's something um, outside looking in. Those are some things to really, really focus on. Um, if, if you're not just a devout North Alabama guy. Uh, and now, you know, I guess we the, the hardest part of this all was uh, the predictions for me of how they're going to finish. They only had two wins last year in, in the OVC. Uh, a few close games could have flip-flopped. So I had four games that were within a possession or two. Um, I think the stat and, and, and football and the NFL especially is if, if you're in those one-score games, um, you expect the next year to 50% to flip it, right? So those uh, those those losses, it turns it turn into wins, right? So if you count those this year, that automatically will say we'll say around the five win mark, okay? Uh, and then something else to point out too here: there are only two wins last year, and they son MVP of the games according to Ken Palm, Daniel Ortiz and Damon Force. Your two your two MVPs and two wins. That's something. Both those guys are returning, right? Big deal. Okay. Got the conference lineup in front of me right here, or the conference schedule in front of me right here, okay? And I'm – and this is, once again, we're 123 days out, okay? I'm going to make this pick with the best of my ability. I haven't done a recorder to break down for everybody, but your boy's putting some time on the computer here just looking over who we have coming in, uh, who we had going out, um, and ratings and everything like that. So initially I have one, two, three, four. I have five games that I think are winnable, but are losable as well. Um, and then I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I have six, I have six games that I think are dubs, right? I, I think you get Stetson at home, it's a dub, Queens at home's a dub, Kent, Kent State um, coming down the stretch there. The last second to last game, I think that's a dub. You have Austin P coming into your house late in the season. Really, and just because I'm, you know, former OVC as well, we all have to put beat downs on Austin P. I'm I'm very sorry, Austin P fans. Welcome to the league. Okay. I'm gonna pick everybody to beat you this year. I don't care if, if you're gonna be good or not. Uh welcome to the league. Okay, so if you get that right, and they finish around that eight, nine, even good could be 10. Good 10 would be extremely good. 10 would be getting wins over, over your Bellarmines, over your Jacksonville States. That's how you would have to get to 10 wins. Um, and this is even saying that they would split with Central Arkansas, and I think Central Arkansas is going to be a dog this year. So I'm not really sure they – who knows if they even win one of those. North Alabama fans, I don't mean this in a bad way. I think seven wins and this A Sun, with how much of a turnover you had, with how many new guys and how bad last year was, I think seven or eight wins with versatility gets you a decent, decent place in the postseason tournament. You have shooters. You potentially have one of the best offensive players in the league. I think that might be best case scenario. I, I really uh, – I know Pujo and all those guys over North Alabama, you should expect to win a league, man. Expect to win every game. Uh, and this is coming from a guy who just looks at the computer screen. So I'm going to say eight wins. I'm going to say they finish in the middle of the pack. Um, I'm going to say Ortiz is a first-team all-A center. I'm going to say Jakari Lane is a freshman, a center. Braster will be a newcomer. Um, and really, if you get – and I keep looking at these ones I have circled like flip-flop games. You know, if you get a win or two over Lipscomb, you slip one in against Bellarmine, right? If that gets to nine wins, 10, if that gets to nine wins and they finish in that top, top half of the league, how does Pujol not get a look for coach of the year? Getting two wins and then completely flopping your roster. For me, that's that's a coach of the year candidate. Um, especially if these guys coming in, if, if this recruiting class 
does as much for this program as I think it can. Um, a lot of X factors, right? But I, I think I think that that that's that's a possibility. This this is a good team we're talking about, and this is going to be fun, man. And just 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 to kind of set set the stage for the rest of these team rankings. This is the worst team in the league last year that we're talking about, and I just said they have potential to win eight games. That's saying something, and and really, there's not an easy one on there, right? Like I, I have some uh, the wins over Stetson marked. Stetson's going to be tough. Um, yeah, so there you go. That's your team. That's your team preview for North Alabama. Hopefully, everybody in North Alabama is still okay with me. It's my first podcast, first time doing this. Um, reach out to me on Twitter, man, with any news, notes, anything I can do to get better, anything you want to see on this. Um, I have so much fun watching all these games, especially, man, I'll get three or four TVs rolling on a thir- an A-Sun Thursdays is what we call them here at the house. I'll get three or four TVs rolling on ESPN Plus, man, and we'll just and I'll take it all in. Uh, really, really looking forward to this season. These team breakdowns are going to be out weekly, man. I'm going to do these weekly until the season starts. Like I said, Rothstein, is, we're 123 days left, man, until we tip. We had coaches out on the recruiting trail tweeting it out today. We're, in my mind, we're full basketball season. Summer league's in full swing. I'm ready, man. Um, just, just stay tuned. Um, at the Sunny Side Pod, follow us on Twitter. Uh, and yeah, keep it cool and uh, stay on the sunny side.